The Impact Investors Council's efforts over the years has been laser focused on building a coherent impact narrative and catalyzing greater flows of capital to impact investing market in India. In the last decade, we have seen the sector grow by leaps and bounds with about 600 impact enterprises impacting over 500 million lives in the country. However, what we do see is much of this funding even today stems from international capital. This presents an untapped opportunity for key domestic players such as family offices and HNIs to meaningfully participate in the development narrative of the economy. We believe impact investments offer a unique long-term opportunity to family offices with the potential to combine social and financial returns. Even on the demand side of the capital, the impact entrepreneurs can benefit materially from the Indian family offices by leveraging their strategic capital and their entrepreneurial expertise. India still has to unlock the full potential of family offices and there's an urgent need to enhance the understanding and knowledge about the sector among diverse stakeholders in the industry. In a first of its kind study, Impact Investors Council and Waterfield Advisors have come together to present a comprehensive picture on the state of impact investing practices amongst family offices and HNIs in India. We have attempted to answer a variety of questions, such as, is impact invest investing a credible investment option? How do family offices and HNIs view the trade-offs between risk return and social impact? What more can be done to engage family offices and catalyze larger flows into the sector? And lastly, as much as we have enjoyed working on the report, we truly hope and believe you would enjoy reading it too. Now, without any further ado, let's jump right into the findings of the report. Can we have the presentation, please? Next slide, please. So just to elaborate on the little bit of the context I shared earlier, impact investments in India has attracted about 11 billion in the last decade with a growth rate of 26%. However, as I mentioned earlier, much of this growth is driven by global institutional investors. Next, please. Therefore, there is significant opportunity for Indian family offices and HNIs to really catalyze domestic capital and assume a larger role in impact investing market in India. And when we really went out to understand the nature and scope of participation of family offices in impact sector, we realized that there was very limited or fragmented data and evidence to really build on this thesis. Therefore, the primary purpose for us for this endeavor has been to really shed the light on the role family offices currently play in impact investing by using rigorous evidence and data. Next, please. Here we have used a two-pronged approach to our research methodology, where much of the data and insights have actually come from IC's proprietary database of 700 plus impact enterprises between 2016 and 2020, combined with a custom survey of 31 family offices and 15 impact funds. And family offices and HNIs with a net worth of dollars uh, 1 million or more with either formal or informal setups have been included in the study. Now, before we actually delve deeper into the findings of the report, let me pause here and pull a poll for the audience and get a sense from the audience itself, what do they think about the participation of family offices in Indian impact investing market? Can we have the poll please? So here is the question. Total quantum of investment made by family offices and HNIs in impact investments in India. Let's see what does the audience think. We'll have about 10 to 15 seconds to respond on the question. It will be really exciting to see what is the opinion the audience here today has on this? All right. A few more seconds for people who still haven't responded.
All right. Wow. 42% of the audience thinks that it is between 0 to 5%. A very related audience, 33%, thinks that it is between 6 to 10%. OK, uh, I think very interesting combination of answers. Now let's move to the next slide and unravel the correct answer here. So yes, uh, the majority uh, thinks correct. The total quantum of uh, impact investments that is coming from family offices is actually 3%, which is between 0 to 5%. So kudos to the audience. So here is a macro picture of what really is happening in terms of the engagement of family offices in impact investment market in India. We see that about 83 uh, unique family offices and HNIs have actively participated in the last five years. And uh, when we look at the entire universe of family offices and HNIs who have been investing in venture capital deals, we see 20% of those family offices actually investing in impact, which actually means that there is a very strong opportunity and potential here to engage at least 400 more HNIs and family offices into the impact sector. Therefore, we do believe that while the participation of family offices is steadily rising in the impact sector in India, their investments is yet to become incremental. Therefore, there is strong impetus on the industry itself to engage the sector better and sustain family offices participation uh, towards impact investments. Can we move to the next slide? Now, when, now that we have uh, got some sense on the macro picture, let's try and understand the scope and nature of investments by family offices in the impact sector. Now, when we look at the total contribution of impact investment by family offices, which is about uh, $300 million, we see that family offices have shown a clear preference towards direct deals. And this is primarily because direct ownership in the form of equity has allowed for a much more hands-on role and ha has also given the flexibility for more deliberate impact choices. And also in the study, one of the challenges that have very starkly emerged is that AIF as an asset class structure itself is relatively new for family offices, and there's a general perception that it can restrain liquidity for a long time. Next slide, please. Now, when we look at the stages of investment, we see family offices and HNI is sort of adopting some kind of a barbell approach, where a large pool of family offices and HNIs are investing in small ticket sizes in earlier stages of seed and series A whereas a small handful, more mature family offices, more committed family offices, placing larger bets in late stage deals such as series B plus. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now, in terms of the sectors of in, uh, investment, uh, sectors that are of interest to family offices, it actually comes with no surprise that financial inclusion has remained the mainstay whether it comes to volume of participation by family offices. But we do see some significant traction coming up in other emerging sectors such as climate finance or climate tech, where a few family offices have actually taken larger bets in segments such as EVs. Now, I hand it over to my colleague Anushri to take us through the rest of the presentation and the findings of the, of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Dipanshi, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anushri. I lead some of the impact work at Waterfield. Um, having understood the broad lay of the land from Dipanshi, what I want to do is deep dive into some of the soft term qualitative perception based uh, uh, findings from the study in terms of what motivates family offices, what are their expectations from impact investments. Uh, this is important, right, because impact investment brings together uh, two seemingly uh, incompatible, even conflicting ideas of social environmental impact on one side and financial returns on the other side. And traditionally, we've not mixed these buckets, right? So there's a lot of skepticism, there's a lot of confusion around uh, whether this is possible. When we speak to family offices, we generally get drawn into these discussions around whether 
you know, what is the role of philanthropy? What is the role of investment? Whether you can actually earn a return while doing good, whether one should even do that, right? What are the moral kind of uh, considerations around that? Uh, whether, you know, problems can be solved while earning, uh, generating a, a healthy returns. So I think all of those considerations actually feed into family officers' decision or sometimes indecision and inaction, right? Um, now, as you can see, the survey data clearly shows that family officers are uncertain, undivided, uh, sorry, uncertain, undecided, a little bit sitting on the fence, right? So you have around 50-50 sort of, you know, distribution. A bunch, 50%, half of the family officers we spoke to uh, actually thought that social impact and financial returns can go hand in hand. Uh, a similar proportion preferred to be true to form. They said, let's keep philanthropy for doing good. Let investment earn the returns. And we don't want to muddy the waters by mixing these two, right? Uh, now, this disassociation or a very binary worldview to say years impact and years investment and you can't mix the two was identified as the topmost barrier for unlocking family office participation by the industry by impact funds that we spoke to. Um, and when we've interacted with family offices, we've actually realized that this confusion does lead to inaction, right? They prefer to wait and watch. They prefer to understand the sector a little more before actually making commitments. Uh, but what we've also realized is that there is a very concrete opportunity to work with family offices, with data, with evidence, uh, with some amount of handholding, honest, candid conversations with them to actually move them towards impact investment. So for us, I think this is an opportunity where the sector really needs to have concerted action uh, around building that sort of confidence and impact investment as a concept, right? Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, another very, uh, you know, highly sort of contested, debated, discussed topic, related topic, is around return expectations, right? So we spoke of attitudes towards you know, combining impact and returns being ambivalent. And I think that is also mirrored when you look at return expectations. So if you see the graph, 55% of the family office said that they, have, they, they do expect market rate returns, right? Risk adjusted market rate returns, closer to commercial returns, closer to what their VCP investments would earn. Um, however, there's an equivalent proportion, 45%, which is willing to take a lower return, right? However, the condition there is that the impact is clearly articulated, clearly measured, and clearly proven. And there is an additionality to their investments, right? So you're saying that you can take a lower financial return if your social or environmental return is outsized, disproportionate, or even very clearly proven. Now, again, I think, um, you know, we've heard a lot of these discussions around saying, can businesses that operate at the bottom of the pyramid generate enough returns, right? Do they have adequate margins or not? Does it take longer to realize that returns? Does it take a higher uh, amount of scale to realize those returns, right? But what we are realizing is that there is this pool of family offices, the 45% in the graph, you know, the right-hand side of the arc, which is actually quite willing to work with the ecosystem uh, on a lower return basis, provided we emphasize the impact narrative, we strengthen the impact narrative. And again, for us, this is a latent hidden sort of opportunity or potential to bring these family offices into impact investments. Um, we will revisit this point when we get into the panel discussions with you know, our seasoned panelists around this whole conundrum around uh, returns expectations. Interestingly, if you look at the long report, you'll also realize that there's a little bit of disconnect between what the impact funds have told us and what we actually found from the family offices, right? Um, generally, from the impact fund survey, we saw that you know, majority of the family offices 
expect much higher returns, top quartile, 20% or you know 20% plus IRR, right? Um, and we realize that this could also be because impact funds are also tapping into family offices that are more um, likely or predisposed to invest in uh, venture capital deals, right? So it's the same pool of investors that are also looking at impact investments and so looking at it from that lens. So that could be one of the reasons. Obviously, there are a lot of other reasons. But I think the key takeaway where the message from this finding for us really has been uh, as a sector, as an ecosystem to really work towards bringing that 45% into impact investment and doing justice to the concept of impact investment. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, this is interesting, right? So, I mean, you know, we started seeing all this mixed data, 50% sitting on the fence, not a very clear trend of, you know, which way uh, the sentiment really lies. And I think we started thinking, what really motivates a family office? What's that starting point, the genesis of their journey into impact investment, right? So is it intentional? Is it accidental? Is it opportunistic? Is it a mix of everything? So we decided, let's try and map this out qualitatively through all the interviews that we did, right? Uh, we wanted to really come up with a description of a family office and their characteristics uh, who are most sort of likely to invest in impact, right? Um, and when we started doing our research, I think, you know, as with most things, we realized we can't straight jacket them. It's not a one glove fits all. So there are two entry points that we discovered into impact investments. And I mean, this is not unique. I think this has been a global trend. Either you come at it from a venture capital world and you're getting into social venture capitalism, which is impact investment, or you come at it from a venture philanthropy world and you're getting at it from a very strong impact focused lens, right? Now, depending on where you enter impact investment, uh, your returns expectations, your preference for early stage, late stage, your preference for certain sectors, uh, your preference for certain asset class, whether it's equity or debt, all of that will change depending on this. So we realize there are these four personalities, right? And we've, we've kind of categorized them uh, that emerged uh, in terms of family offices who make impact investments. The first is your champion. So these are veterans prolific sort of track record of impact investments, very early adopters, even before the term itself was really coined, right? Um, balanced return and uh, impact expectations, the will willing to invest early, willing to stay the course, very vested, very hands-on, but also have enough experience to be able to navigate all of you know, the requirements that comes along with being very hands-on. Then you have your philanthropist turned impact investor. Right, so coming at it from the left-hand side, very strong focus on impact. The motivation is to really see that philanthropy can only go so far as far as scale and sustainability is concerned, right? Because you're always dependent on grant funding. You're always dependent on external donations. So can impact investment be the answer to the problems of scale and sustainability? So really that is the motivation with which they come at uh, this. Now, again, these are the guys who are very patient, willing to take slightly lower returns, but raise a sharp focus on impact and additionality. Then comes your explorer. So again, no surprise there, but you know, sort of the, typically the next generation in the family, um, you know, just testing the waters, dipping their toes into this. They have an intellect, intellectual curiosity to really you know, grapple with this very nebulous uh, sort of conflicting idea of impact investment. And again, what we realized here very interestingly is that women in the next generation are driving a lot of these conversations in their families. So when we started talking to them, we realized that they were the ones who were, you know, maybe attending external courses, participating in forums and platforms and taking up or adopting the idea, internalizing it, and then championing it within their family offices. Um, and we have some evidence of this. It's obviously anecdotal, even globally. Even globally, we've seen women in the next generation really uh, being in the driver's seat. 
And then comes your commercial investor uh, who's coming at this from the right hand side, from the venture capitalism side. For, for the commercial investor, it's obviously, you know, the returns considerations that drive this. They do, they may or may not have a very specific impact thesis, but they do sort of understand that, you know, there will be a sort of impact, environmental or social impact of their investments, and they do track it, right? So these are the four kind of personality types. Now, I think the main message or the key takeaway for us here is that this reinforced the idea that impact investment is not binary. It's not a zero sum game, right? It's a very flexible, it's a very versatile asset class. There is enough room for very different types of investors, family offices to really place themselves on a continuum of returns and uh, impact. Um, and you can move along this continuum, right? So the whole question then to our mind was that if this is a very promising asset class, what is stopping family offices from really participating in this? And that takes us to our barriers. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, before I get into the barriers, I just wanted to point out an interesting statistic that we're not included here, but it's in the report. So we found that of the 83 family offices that had invested in impact between 2016 and 2020, only 20% actually made a subsequent investment in the same duration, right? Which basically indicates that retention is low, right? And there are many reasons why this could be. Um, through our survey, through our interviews, we've documented some of the common barriers here. Uh, we've divided them into industry-wide barriers and product barriers, right? So if you look at the industry barriers, a lot of it is to do uh, with articulation of impact, measurement of impact, management of impact, right? Um, and again, this is not unique to India. This has been a global issue, but I think it's a little more pronounced in India because we're just catching up uh, in terms of, you know, our journey on impact investment. The sector is still nascent. It's still evolving. Um, but again, I think it's also symptomatic of early market development, right? So most kind of, you know, early ideas, market development would go through similar issues where you don't have common language, standardized frameworks, expertise, talent to really understand this. So I think it's, it's not very alarming to us. And I think uh, it's also encouraging that we've made some progress in addressing this. Um, the one in finding which was personally very interesting to me uh, was the last one on the industry-wide barriers, which is um, the issue with wealth advisors, right? Now, this was brought up interestingly on both the sides. So the family offices brought it up, but also the industry brought it up or the impact funds brought it up, right? To say that today, and again, this is true globally, more pronounced in India, but wealth advisors in general have not been able to really educate themselves on the nuances of impact investment. So for them, these are you know, products which are again categorized with say, you know, other sort of VC funds or you know, uh, VC deals, right? So it's one amongst that basket of products that they may take to family offices. And the impact deal then starts competing with these, right? Which is which is not fair, but more importantly, it does not do fidelity or justice to the very unique nature of impact investment, which is returns plus impact, right? So I think there was this um, thing, almost a unanimous kind of a need to say that wealth advisors need to really be, um, you know, more sensitive, more informed. And because, you know, they, the family offices lean so strongly on them for advice and guidance, uh, that's, that's the part of the ecosystem that needs to be strengthened. We now look at the product specific barriers. Um, again, not, not surprising, I think we've heard this often, lack of pipeline, right? Lack of good quality pipeline was the topmost barrier. Again, early market kind of, you know, um, uh, development challenge or a barrier. And it, it depends, right? So we're saying that we have many opportunities in early stages, but not those many good opportunities in later stages. So there are two issues, right? Either lack of good quality opportunities and the narrower you go with your preferences, with your choices as an impact investor, the funnel also narrows in terms of the opportunities, right? Because the market doesn't have that sort of depth today. Uh, the second issue is just lack of awareness 
the opportunities exist, the options exist. It's just that the family offices may not have access to these options, right? They don't have access to the right forums or platforms or people who can actually um, unlock these opportunities for them. So it's a little bit of, you know, uh, both, uh, both of these things, right? Um, I will now quickly look, I know we're going to run out of time. We're going to quickly just spend a few minutes on the recommendations. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, okay, so, I mean, we obviously, uh, the recommendations that we've listed here have been curated based on the insights that we gathered during our interviews, right, or during our surveys. So we want these to be as relevant, practical, action-oriented as possible, not academic. We've divided the recommendations again into two categories, recommendations for family offices and then for the broader ecosystem. Now, if you start with recommendations for family offices, right? The first one is really at the heart of this entire debate about what is philanthropy, what is impact investment. There are other buckets of, you know, blended finance, social finance, right? Um, and I think this was an idea that, you know, really Soumya came up with internally in one of our discussions to say, it's actually capital for sustainable development. The end goal for this capital is to actually make a meaningful difference to some of the larger social environmental problems of the country, right? So if you actually adopt a broader lens to this um, and say that this is the capital that I allocate to solve some of the challenges, then based on the solution and based on the needs of that solution, you can either use grants, you can either do impact investments, or you can, you know, invest in blended finance products or outcome-based financing. All of these become pathways or tools or means to an end, right? And the one thing we realized is, you know, very often family offices unintentionally end up displacing one with the other. So if I'm doing impact investment, I'm pulling it out of my philanthropy portfolio or I'm pulling it out of my VC portfolio, right? And we realize there's enough room for all these different types of capitals to coexist and actually complement each other. So I'll give you a very quick example. Um, and I hope he's joined the panel. We spoke to an investor and he told us how uh, he has a nonprofit foundation. Through the foundation, he focuses on building collaborations between NGOs, right? No business model, no revenue opportunities there. That's a pure play philanthropy. At the same time, through his impact investment, he's investing in technology that strengthens the NGO sector. So be it crowdfunding solutions, be it payment gateways for the NGOs, uh, be it information and communication technologies used in rural areas. These are models where there is you know, a revenue model that's possible. And so these go into his impact investment basket, right? And so very neatly, he's integrated seeming, uh, seamlessly his vision of strengthening the social impact sector by actually allocating capital from these two buckets. Um, a second sort of recommendation you know, follows from the first, which is to say, impact investment has many options. There's debt, there's equity, there's direct deals, there's impact funds, there's sector specific, sector agnostic, it's very easy to get lost. It's very easy to get overwhelmed with it. So it's much better for a family office to have a strategy, an investment thesis and an impact thesis, both, both parts of the strategy, which will then guide them on their impact investment journeys, have a pool of capital, which is allocated to impact investment rather than, you know, sort of carving it out from, you know, separate things and have a proper plan to say in the next three to five years, these are my goals. In fact, and again, I hope, I think she's joined the panel. We're working with the family uh, with, with an H&I. Uh, she's a very new entrant to impact investment with a very learning perspective, right? So she has a learning agenda set for herself for the next three years to say, what is it that I want to learn through my impact investment strategy, right? What are the failures? What are the achievements? Where can I scale up? What should I not get into? What is too risky? Again, a very good strategy for somebody who's just entering the space, right? It's a little bit of hands-on learning, experiential learning. The third one is the bubble strategy. And this is really to you know, navigate or overcome this whole um, you know, debate about returns versus impact or you know, impact first, return first, right? So just like we have a bubble strategy in investment, um, you know, it is possible to combine different types of options in the same portfolio. So you can do a debt or an equity, 
or you can do an impact fund and a few uh, direct deals. So they all balance. You know, some will give you the deliberate choice that you want, that I want to invest in this particular sector or this type of an enterprise or have this kind of impact. The others will spread the risks for you, right? They will bring in the expertise of professionals so that you don't kind of have to do the heavy lifting and you can benefit from and leverage their experience. So really just balancing this out within your own portfolio can actually help to, uh, you know, overcome that sort of conundrum. Um, on the industry side, right? And again, this is pretty much a, a no-brainer. Investing in education and not just of the family offices. I think that is obviously very important. And we've, we've kind of realized that over the course of last one year while we've been doing the study, but also the ecosystem around the family offices. So be it their impact advisors, be it their wealth advisors, I think it's very important to bring all of them onto platforms and forums where they can actually drive their own learning agendas and learn from each other, right? The second one is this opportunity to expand the base of family offices. And we spoke about this, right? That 45% uh, who, who are still out there who are willing to kind of, you know, take slightly lower returns, but who are very bullish on impact. How do we get them into this ecosystem? And one of the ways to do that is to actually strengthen the impact narrative. Now, in most cases, we realize that on-ground impact is actually happening. So it's not like, you know, there's impact washing. It's the tracking, the communication, the rigor of measuring that sometimes is missing, right? So just to be able to really uh, strengthen that. And the last is obviously, you know, to kind of uh, have that variety of products so that each of those archetypes can actually participate uh, in impact investment and align to their own priorities and interests. 